Luke chapter 22. And look at verse number 39. Luke 22, verse 39. This, my dear friends, is the word of the Lord. Let all who have ears now hear. And he came out and he went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. The disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down, and he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Thanks be to God for this word. Amen. After Job lost his livelihood, all of his livestock, all of his servants, all of his wealth, and then after he lost his children and all of his grandchildren, and after he lost his health and was covered in boils and open sores, and after his wife told him to curse God and die, Job said these words, What I have always feared has come true, and what I dread has now come. I have no quiet, I have no rest, I have no peace, only trouble. I start my sermon with that quote from Job because we're traveling through the story of Jesus, his passion, his final week on earth before he was crucified. And we've come to a place in that narrative where Jesus embodies exactly what Job said. That which I have feared is here. That which I have dreaded has come true and is now. And I have no peace. I have no rest. I have no quiet. We've come to that place in the life of Jesus where the real work of securing your salvation and my salvation actually begins. His redemptive mission that the Father sent him on commences in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see that his blood begins to flow. The blood that the Apostle Paul told us is what purchased our salvation. That blood did not begin to flow on the cross. It began to flow in the Garden of Eden. What we see in the Garden of Gethsemane are the initial feelings within the heart of Jesus of his Father beginning to back away. What we see in the Garden of Gethsemane is his body being wrenched with pain and agony. And what we see in the Garden of Gethsemane is something that we've really never seen of Jesus up to this point. And that is a man who's filled with anxiety and has no peace or rest or quiet within him. What we see in Gethsemane really does dwarf the suffering of Job. 
The suffering of Job is unfathomable to us. But the suffering of Jesus in Gethsemane is completely inscrutable. And though we get some of it from the gospel writers, ultimately it is deeply, deeply mysterious and deeply, deeply hard to read about and hard to picture with the eyes of our heart. We've reached the place where Jesus enters the Garden of Gethsemane, but his truck there started in the upper room where finally everyone had their stomachs full. And I believe all 11 of those guys who were left had their hearts filled with all kinds of different emotions. The evening must have felt just surreal to them at this point. And probably were on the edge of their seats, if they had seats, anticipating what was going to come next. And Jesus prayed that beautiful prayer was recorded in John 17. And they sang hymns and they worshiped together. And then Jesus rose and began to lead them down the stairs and out of that house to make their way to the Mount of Olives where the Garden of Gethsemane was and is located. It was good and dark by now. In Israel, in those days, it was one of those darks where you can't see your hand in front of your face. Some of them surely had some lamps that were lit, while others, I'll bet, were holding torches that were lit. And Jesus began to lead them in a northeast direction. It's believed that the upper room was just in the southeastern side of Jerusalem, if not even just outside the city of Jerusalem there. And the Mount of Olives was northeast of there, and they had to traverse through the Kidron Valley. And they began to make their way there and walk there carefully. And I imagine there may have been a little bit of chatter going on, but probably not much. And after walking so far, Jesus stops. He stops because he wants their attention. He has to say something to them. And rather than just say it as they're walking, that, that casual feeling, he wanted them to take these words in. As he stopped and he looked at his 11 guys, his 11 friends, the apostles, his circle of friends, and he said to them, tonight you're going to abandon me. Tonight you're going to desert me. And doing that will fulfill the scriptures that says, when the shepherd is struck, the sheep will scatter. And that's going to happen tonight, guys. And he no more got the last word out of his mouth when Peter said, not me. I'll never do that. I'll never desert you. I'll never go away. All the rest of these guys may do it, but I'm telling you, Lord, I'll never do that. And Jesus, I, I doubt, was upset or consternated, but maybe. I do see, however, him taking a deep breath at that point and saying, Peter, did you forget what I said to you not less than an hour ago? Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny that you even know me let alone not desert me. You're going to be asked, and you're going to reply not once, not twice, but three times. I don't even know who he is. And that last one, Peter, you're going to be aggravated. You're going to want him to believe you so much. You're going to be irritated and let him know, I do not know that guy. You're going to do that, Peter. So don't say you're not going to desert me when you're going to be telling people you don't even know me. And then Peter did what he's done a time or two before, rather audacious. He pushed back against what the Lord was saying. Can you imagine? He just sort of pushed back and he said, no, I won't. I'd never do that to you, Lord. And Jesus just turned, I think, and began to walk without saying another word. And the guys followed him. 
toward the Mount of Olives. And when they got to the Mount of Olives, they began to make their way up. But this garden that Jesus was heading to was on the western side of the mountain. Remember that on the eastern side, it overlooks the city of Jerusalem and the temple. That's where they climbed up to and sat during that Olivet Discourse. This time they were going to go over the ridge of the mountain and down so far because the garden is actually on the side of that mountain. And so he walked and went up over that mountain to the garden of Gethsemane, a place that they were familiar with. We're told, and we'll look at in coming weeks, that the reason Judas knew that that's where they could find him was because Jesus often took his guys there. It was a favorite spot of his. He often stayed in Bethany with Martha and Mary, and that was a very close place to there, and obviously is a very serene place, a place that is filled with a beautiful grove of olive trees. And that's significant. That's really important to the story. Because the word Gethsemane is made up of two Hebrew words. The first one means to press, and the second one means oil. Gethsemane really is the place of the oil press. And I don't know if you've ever seen an ancient oil press, but it matters for today's story. And I brought a couple of pictures along so you could see what they look like. Here's the first one. You'll see that they made this massive concrete base. And after making that base, they hewn out of it this path, if you will, And then they made this enormous stone, this enormous stone wheel, and placed inside that path, inside that place, after making a hole through the center. And what they would do with that hole, I'll show you in this second picture, is they would run either a smaller branch through or a large beam like that. And the idea would be then that they would fill the perimeter of this press with olives. And if it was a small enough press, which they made various sizes, if it was a small enough press, then there would be men that would grab hold of that large branch or stick that was through there, and they would walk it around and around. Something like this, though, they would attach to a donkey, and they would lead the donkey All around and around and around it would go, crushing and pressing and squeezing and pulverizing the olives so that they could get the oil. Because olive oil, well, it's popular for us today, but was a huge commodity in those days. They used olive oil to cook like we do. They used olive oil over their unleavened bread or the bread when they would make it, often like we do. But they also used the oil for religious purposes, to anoint people for different religious reasons. And then they also used it as oil in the lamps that they could light in the evening to see. And they used it for several different medicinal purposes. And they even used it to make soap. So olive oil was very important to them, very important. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, there would be several of these oil presses that would be at various places, and I'm told that there still are some oil presses in that section of the Mount of Olives. Thanks, Char. And the reason that's significant is because it acts as a symbol of what was about to start happening to Jesus. When Jesus arrives at this garden, we'll see as he is squeezed and pressed and emotionally pulverized. And if you'll allow me, the oil of his spirit is wrung out in Gethsemane. As he begins to get closer to the garden 
in the vicinity of it, he stops again and he tells the guys, this is as far as you're going to go. So I need you to stay here. And then he pointed to Peter and James and John and said, but you three are going to come with me. And Jesus and Peter and John began to make their way closer to the garden. But as they came close to the garden, Jesus stopped them and said, this is as far as you're going to go. And then he said these words to these three guys. My soul is exceedingly overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Imagine hearing that from the Savior. But he says it to them there. Now, I'm going to tell you more about the words in a minute, but I'll tell you the words that he used there very well meant that he had a stomach ache. There was a nausea within him. And what he said to the guys is, I'm so overwhelmed right now, I feel like I could die. And then he says this to them, so pray. I want you to pray. And watch that you don't fall into temptation. I brought you guys with me here to pray. And then he walked away from them. And when he got in the garden, we're told by Matthew and Mark that he fell face down in the dirt. Some of the paintings and prints that you see of him beautifully knelt by a rock just not true. Don't see a man kneeling down by a rock to just have some time of prayer. See with the eyes of your heart a man who is prostrate on the ground with his face literally in the dirt, the text tells us. And it's here the gospel writers begin to tell us about his emotional state. Because it's very important for these writers that we know his feelings at this time, that we know the state of his inner world, his heart, his soul, what was going on on the inside. And so the gospel writers, they use words like grieved, deeply grieved, distressed, troubled, sorrowful, overwhelmed with grief. Those are some of the words they used. One Greek expert that I read said that these gospel writers exhaust the resources of language to convey to us the conception of our Lord's agony. All they have are words. But he's right, this Greek expert who says, but they exhaust the vocabulary of these adjectives that describes what was really going on in him. And I think they're right, and I'm glad we know this. And near the end of my sermon, I'll circle back to this, but I think they're right, and I'm glad they, they don't really tell us what he was thinking. They don't really remind us of the mission. They really don't do any of that. They just want us to know how he was feeling right now. And when you look at the Greek words that are under all the English words that describe his emotional state, then you see that these words are emotionally charged with emotion. I mean emotionally charged. They're electric in describing emotion. These words, when we take them all together, means that Jesus was filled with anxiety that he was bereft of all peace and solace. He was agitated. He was depressed. He was overcome with sorrow. He was brokenhearted. He was despondent. And he was struck with amazement. That last one really gets me for some reason. Because I really looked into that word, struck with amazement. Was he amazed in that he... He's surprised this is even happening? That, that's not really it per se. Have you ever, and I hope you haven't, but I bet a lot of you have gotten that phone call 
that a loved one's in the ER and it comes out of nowhere and it's serious and you rush to the ER and you're there and at one point you might start feeling or even verbalize things like this. What's happening? I can't even believe I'm here. I feel kind of out of touch right now. I'm amazed at this. What? I, I was just eating dinner. And now I'm here. That's this word. That's this word where in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's this feeling in Jesus of, I, I can't believe this is happening to me. What is going on? That which I've always feared is here. That which I've dreaded has come true. But why in the garden did he begin feeling this way? Why now? Why not after he was arrested? Or why not hold off those emotions to the cross? Why, why in the garden was he feeling these strong emotions? Emotions that we have never seen of the Savior. Emotions that maybe if there were not the Garden of Gethsemane, we would never believe that Jesus could feel. B.B. Warfield, and I've quoted this a lot, B.B. Warfield, the great theologian in his work, The Emotional Life of Jesus, he says that we struggle so much with picturing Jesus like this because of his perfection. And we think in the perfection of Jesus, he could not feel this kind of anxiety, this kind of dread and fear and being overwhelmed and being depressed and being agitated. And we, in his perfection, we can't picture this guy without peace, without solace and rest and quiet in his spirit. We can't picture that. But the gospel writers reveal a reality about our Savior that, church, I'm telling you, we need to see. He was filled with intense terror. Filled with a pain that was all pervasive. These words also tend to give us the feeling of being hemmed in like there's no way out, no escape. But why in the garden? Well, it's because, as I said earlier, we might not think this way much, but in the garden is where the redemptive work of Jesus really begins. Where the, the redemptive work proper, if you will, really begins in the garden of Gethsemane. John Calvin wrote of the garden, it is here as he moves into the garden where we see the exordium of his awful and dreadful torture begin. Big John Calvin word just means the beginnings of. It's in the garden where we see the beginnings of, the exordium, the preface, if you will, of the awful torture begin. There's an Italian priest who's still living and wrote a, a profound book called The Mystery of Easter. His name is Renero Cantalamassa. I worked on that. <laughs> and he says this about Gethsemane. Gethsemane, Gethsemane reveals the interior aspect of Jesus' passion, the death of his heart, which precedes and gives meaning to the death of his body. Gethsemane signals the deepest depression in the passing of our Lord Jesus from this world to the Father. Garrett Scott Dawson has written a great article called The Agony of the Cross. But before he gets to the cross, he spends time in Gethsemane. So he gives his interpretation of what's behind the, the, the pain and sorrow and agony of Jesus in Gethsemane. And I, I think he's on to something. Dawson writes, to be pressed down with grief like an olive under a millstone 
He had the weight of the world on his back, knowing he will be crushed by it. To fear, despite earlier predictions otherwise, that he'll never get up again. And knowing that if he does not rise, neither will the world. All will have been in vain. All will have been lost. All he wanted, all he prayed for, worked for, yearned for, will be gone. All the power he expended to heal will be for naught. All his world, this world that he tasted with such joy, will become ashes in his mouth. Everyone and everything he loves will be lost forever. But worse, yea, far worse, it's the presence that he has always known is evaporating. The comforting assurance of his father's love in his heart, felt since his youth, is now being taken away. Jesus feels that he is becoming repugnant to his father. God, it seems, has turned away his face. Such emptiness horrifies him. The solid sense of everlasting arms underneath him gives way to a yawning abyss. Nothing awaits but endless darkness. That's why in the garden he becomes overwhelmed. I've always wondered a bit, why did he bring these three guys with him and why did he stop them there? Why didn't he bring them into the garden? Why did Peter, James, and John only allowed to go so far and then he stopped them? And I've come to the conclusion that he knew that what he had to go in the garden and do and begin, he had to do alone. It would just be him and his father alone for this work that was about to begin, this redemptive mission that the father sent him on. It would just be him and his father alone. I've been in many a hospice room. And it's interesting that even though many times those rooms are filled with family and friends and loved ones, ultimately the dying laying on the bed is alone. Because now he must go through what only he can go through at that moment. And I think the reason Jesus stops the guys and has them begin praying there and then moves on is because it's time for him to be alone and do this work. But then it makes me wonder, well, why did you bring him then? Why couldn't they stay with the other eight? Quick math thing. Why couldn't they stay with the other eight? Why'd you bring them that far? Well, you know in Gethsemane, all we see is the humanity of Jesus. And understanding all these emotions, he knew he had to be alone, but he didn't want to be alone. He needed his friends, and he needed them close. And then I thought about a little section in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. If you've never read Lewis's great work, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you should feel heavy shame right now <laughs> and go get that book. <laughs> there comes a place in the Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe where Aslan, and he's that giant, majestic lion that symbolizes and represents Jesus. There comes a time where Laz, or, or Aslan is making his way to his death. And his won't be a cross. Aslan's is a stone table that he'll be placed upon where he'll be murdered. And as he's walking toward that place of the stone table, he enters his Gethsemane. And Lewis tells us that he's filled with sadness, and this majestic lion is walking with his head bowed so low that his nose is almost dragging the ground, Lewis says. And then a couple little girls show up. 
Lucy and Susan. And Lucy and Susan come up and they begin walking on either side of this lion, Aslan. And as they're walking along this place, heading towards this stone table, they both ask him, Aslan, dear Aslan, said Lucy, what's wrong? Please tell us. Are you sick, dear Aslan, asked Susan. No, said Aslan, I'm sad and lonely. Lay your hands on my mane so that I can feel that you're there. And would you keep your hands in my mane so that I can feel you? I want to know you're there, and let's walk like that. And so the girls did what they would never have dared to do without his permission, but they'd always longed to do it. They buried their cold hands in the beautiful sea of fur, and they stroked it. And so doing, doing, they walked the rest of the way with him. And I think when Jesus took Peter, James, and John, Lewis captures it, so allow me. He was saying, I'm sad. Walk with me. Put your hands in my mane. I just need to know you're there. And then he gets him to the place and he just says, pray. Would you pray? I think that's what's going on with those three guys. And Jesus, on the ground, face down, begins to pray. And he prays, Abba. That's the translation of the word Father there. Abba, Abba, please take this cup from me. Let this cup pass over me. I don't want to drink from this cup. I don't want this cup. This cup terrifies me. Please take this cup from me. Take it away, Abba. But let your will be your will. Let your will be your will. Nevertheless, your will be done. And he prayed that over and over and over. A few times he got up to go check on his guys. He went back to be with his guys. And I don't think it was to go back and just spy on them. I think he went back just to be near them. And when he came, he found them sleeping. And we're quick to get on those guys. But Luke tells us, because of their sorrow, they slept. Who sleeps to escape pain? I want something to eat and a nap when I'm hurting. And because of sorrow, these guys fell asleep. And these three different times that Jesus went out, he said, can't you wake up and watch with me? Please, I need you to watch with me. Pray, guys. And he would go back and continue to pray, Abba, take the cup, but your will be done. You know what? On a side note, we see Jesus doing what he taught the disciples to do. When you pray, you pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here in the depth of his agony, he practices what he preaches. And he shows us that he's overwhelmed with terror and anxiety and fear and hemmed in. He's despondent. He has no peace, no solace. And he tells the Father, take this from me, but your will be done. Your will be done, your will be done, but take it, this conflict that must have been raging in him. I don't want to do this. Find another way. Do something else. Take this cup from me. But I want your will to be done. I'm just hoping this one's your will. He keeps praying about that cup over and over. That cup. Take this cup. Let this cup pass over me. This cup. Well, he uses that little analogy because the cup of God symbolizes the wrath of God, the rage of God, the fury of God. 
we read things like later in the book of Job where Job is talking about at one point the wicked will be forced to drink of the cup of the wrath of God. God tells the prophet Jeremiah, take my cup of wine, the cup of wine of my wrath, and take it to the rebellious nations and force them to sip from it. Psalm 75 calls it a foaming cup of the wrath of God. And in Revelation 14, we read that the day will come when God will pour out the cup of his wrath on the wicked. Why is Jesus praying, take this cup from me? Because he knows if he moves forward, he'll be forced to drink it. And on the cross, it will be poured out over him. You see, this might be good for someone in here to hear. For any and all who reject Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior, they will, there's no getting around it, they will one day drink of the wrath of God. It's coming. It's coming. You won't escape it. But coming to the Lord Jesus and declaring him Lord and declaring him Savior and giving him your life and turning from your sins and placing your faith in him, then Jesus taking that cup means you'll never have to take that cup. He took it. That's the theological word propitiation. There it is. Diverts the cup of the wrath of God. The foaming cup of wrath takes it from you and puts it on him. That's the good news of the gospel. Why would you relieve this room without getting that taken care of? And all you have to do is where you are in your heart, just say that. You don't need to follow me praying a prayer. You don't need to walk this aisle. You just need to, from your heart, say, God, I'm not sure I'm understanding everything involved in this, but I don't want your wrath on me. I want the sacrifice of Jesus to be completely sufficient for me. I come to you. I come to you. I come to you. That's how people are converted and regenerated. So he's praying, take this cup. Take this cup. Again, B.B. Warfield says, the floods that lie before him under which is to be submerged and the thoughts of passing beneath these waters straightens his soul. Just, just means to think about it. It was, it was taking a soul that was once shaped like this, and it just straightens it out. It misshapens his soul to even think about it. And then we're told that as he was praying, he began to soak his clothes with sweat, and he started to sweat from his head. But what really matters is we're told that after sweating for a while, the sweat turned red, and the sweat began to mingle with blood. You know, that's a real phenomenon. Medically, it's called Hema pedrosis, and I worked on that one too. It's very rare, but it is something that can happen to a human being where under intense, intense pressure, severe affliction, you can spontaneously bleed from your forehead or your eyes or your nose, even your fingernails. One time I was watching, back in the days when I thought I was a strong man, I was watching the strong man, the power man on TV, Eddie Hall, who's called the beast for a reason. And I watched on TV as he set the world record deadlift. He deadlift 1,102 pounds. He's an animal. I'll never forget, though, as he straightened his back with that, that bar bent like that, and as he straightened his back, the camera went to his eyes and blood began to run out of his nose and blood began to trickle from his eyes. 
and he dropped that weight and took a step back and passed out because of the intense strain he put on his body. And here we see that intense strain in the heart and soul of Jesus. Not his body yet, but his heart and soul. And the intensity of that pressure just caused his brow to bleed. Abba, take this cup from me, this fervent, intense praying. I, I think we're seeing the cry of a young man to his daddy. I think we're seeing the cry of a boy to his daddy to save him. And this, this is the agony where his daddy not only doesn't save him, but begins to slowly take some steps back. And knowing, the father knowing that he had to do that, you know what he did? Luke tells us that he sent an angel to strengthen his son. He sent an angel. I've always wondered, what'd that angel do? The word strengthen, I really looked it up and looked into it. And you know what it means? To do whatever makes another one strong. Well, how'd he do it? Or how'd she do it? I don't think there is a sect to an angel. How'd the angel bring a strength and bring it to the Lord? Was it just the angel's presence that did it? Maybe. Maybe. Did the angel come and remind Jesus of all the promises of God? Maybe. Did the angel whisper in the ear of Jesus that this is why he was here and it's a season? And did he, did he encourage Jesus by saying it's a short season and soon you'll be back on your throne? Endure. Endure. Or did... And in my old emotional heart, this is what I see, forgive me. Or did the angel just come and hold him? Or did he do a little of all of it? Whatever it was, the angel showed up to strengthen Jesus. Do you believe in angels? Hmm? Some of you aren't sure. I've always said that if God would give us eyes to see the unseen world for 15 seconds, it would both bring us great joy and comfort and terrify us at the same time. Because there is such a thing as angels. And Hebrews tells us he still dispatches those angels to his kids as ministering spirits, diakonia, serve. He dispatches these angels to his kids to serve us. Serve us what? What we need and we don't even think, I don't even think, that how I got through that was an angel by me. I love when I visit someone in a hospital to read Psalm 91. That's almost always the psalm I bring them to. And I love that part that says, And he will give his angels to the one who fears him, to what? To guard him in all of his ways. And invariably, when I get done reading it, I say, we might not be able to see it, but I believe with all my heart there are angels all around this bed right now. There are angels outside that door. And they're here to guard you and to serve you and to empower you. Well, God sent one to his son, and that angel empowered our Lord. Well, that's where we have to stop the narrative. Pick up next time. I love telling these stories. The story of our Lord. But I can't let us go. Quit packing up. That doesn't mean I'm done. <laughs> doesn't mean we're done, right? I say something like that and everybody's grabbing things. And finally, you know, you get out of here. 
Because I think there's at least two things that we see in Gethsemane, and I hope you see it with the eyes of your heart. I think there's two things that we see in Gethsemane that are for us today that we really can learn and bring to ourselves today. And the first one is this. What we see in Gethsemane is the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the bottomless depths of the love of God. We see that in Gethsemane. Maybe as clear as anywhere, save the cross. We see the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the bottomless depths of the love of God. That's a weird statement, the exceeding sinfulness of sin, but it really does come right out of the Bible. I mean, we'll understand what sin is. When you come to church, you've been a part of church, you're a believer, you read, you understand it. But you know what Paul writes in Romans 7? One of the reasons the commandments came, right? In case you're wondering, why did God even give us the commandments? Paul said, here's one reason. The commandments came so that we would see and recognize the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the depth of sin, the evil of sin. In other words, you might not know what sin is, well, let's just say there are no commandments, and God says you're a sinner. We'd believe him, and we'd understand that. But when we read the commandment, do not lust, all of a sudden we start seeing the depth of our evil, the realness of our evil. Forgive others the way I've forgiven you. All of a sudden, we start seeing how exceedingly sinful sin is. And... All of a sudden, we begin to understand depths of depravity within us that should amaze us consistently because we love Jesus. We want Jesus. We've given our life to Jesus. We live for Jesus. We can't wait to see Jesus. And then day by day by day, we do what offends him and upsets him. And that which hung him on the cross, that which nailed him on the cross, and not only do we do it, but we find pleasure in it. And in Gethsemane, we see the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And I think that's why this whole time of Gethsemane and all of these trials and all of the beatings and everything that happened to Jesus happened. Why wouldn't God just take him to the cross and skip all that? The cross is where, listen, the cross is where he pays for our sin. You don't have to do Gethsemane and the trials and the beatings. Why not go there? To show us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And to show us the depth of obedience of our Lord. Because Paul writes in Romans 5, because of one man's obedience, death came to all. And because of one man's obedience, salvation came to all. The new Adam, the second Adam, the last Adam. Gethsemane shows us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And so does Jesus letting these Roman soldiers chain him. And so do these cockamamie trials that he goes through. And so does the stripping of him naked and spitting upon him and forcing a crown of thorns on him and beating him mercilessly, beating him senselessly, senselessly and then spiking him to a cross. All of the depth of this agony and suffering and pain is there, I believe, to show us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Oh, pray. Pray that God would give you a deeper and more repugnant understanding of sin. But not just that. Gethsemane also shows us the bottomless depths of God's love. Because the reason Jesus is in Gethsemane is to satisfy the justice of God. And the reason Jesus is in Gethsemane satisfying the justice of God is because God loves you that much that he would rather, 
Listen, that he would rather massacre his son than you. Greater love has no man than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And what did Jesus say? And you're my friends. Do you see what is going on in Gethsemane? It's a friend in agony for a friend. There's one other thing I think we should see, and that is Gethsemane actually provides us with an example and a model for when we must enter our own personal Gethsemanes. We see a model there. You ever been to Gethsemane? I I don't mean the place in Israel. I mean your own personal Gethsemane, where you've been filled with agony and pain and suffering, and you feel hemmed in, and you're bereft of peace and rest and quiet. And you sense that even though you believe he'll never leave you or forsake you, you're in your Gethsemane and you sense him backing away a little bit. Like Isaiah 30 says, that in the midst of adversity and affliction, your teacher will hide. And you can look at that later, it's a capital T. You ever been in Gethsemane? Where the suffering and pain is just overwhelming. Well, I think in Gethsemane we see a pattern. We see a model for our Gethsemanes. By the way, if you've never been in one, it's probably coming. And what do we see in Gethsemane? We see the beloved Son of God saying to his Abba, Take this from me. Get me out of this. And that's a model for our Gethsemane. You better pray that way when you're in the midst of pain and suffering. Who wouldn't? Take this from me. Bring my prodigal home. Heal this disease. Right? I wasn't ready for him to die. Bring that peace. Do these things. I'm claiming it. I want it. I'm beseeching you. I'm begging you, I'm asking you, take this from me. But then we also see him saying, but your will be done. And that's a model for us when we're in our Gethsemane. Heal me of this disease. I want healed, I want to live longer. But more, I want your will, Lord. And sometimes we depraved people need to pray more like this. I want to want your will more than I want healing. Because I know your will is what matters the most. So your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And your will be done in my body. And in this situation, there is a model for us when we enter Gethsemane. And then, and then, that's when we embrace the words of Asaph, when we say along with him, whom have I in heaven but you? And this earth has nothing I desire beside you. This old heart and flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That's Gethsemane praise.